The last time that I got sick, the total time that I spent traveling to the hospital, filling out paperwork, and sitting in the waiting room was significantly longer than the one-on-one -on -one time I ended up having with the doctor to diagnose me and give me a prescription for antibiotics. Now, the irony is, I had spent the three previous days completely miserable, getting sicker and sicker, hoping my cold would magically go away, just trying to avoid that doctor's visit. In 1966, a medical device was created that would have allowed me to diagnose myself on day one as soon as I started feeling bad. This singular piece of technology <laughs> had the ability to transform medical system. Unfortunately, it stopped being used when they canceled it on Star Trek. <laughs> Remember uh, the tricorder device that Dr. McCoy used to use? He would simply scan you and tell you everything that's going on with you at that moment. Now, almost 70 years later, this is a little more science than it is fiction. And at Sandia National Laboratories, we are working to make a version of this device. Consider three attributes of the tricorder that we would like to reproduce. The first is that it is small and it's portable. No need for a testing lab. You carry the testing lab around with you. Computers used to be the size of rooms. Now we carry them around in our hand. Why not laboratory equipment? There's a whole field called Lab on a Chip Technologies that allows us to miniaturize medical devices. The second attribute, instant readout and can tell you many things that are going on with you at that moment. Now, the third attribute, which is by far the most difficult challenge for us to reproduce, is that the tricorder was non-invasive. It didn't even have to touch you. So remember this. I'm going to bring this up in a second. But first, let me put two more characteristics that the tricorder didn't have we would like to attempt to do. Let's remove Dr. McCoy from the equation. Let's make the tricorder a wearable device that is continuously monitoring. And let's give it an electronic readout so you can transmit the results. OK, let's go back to the most difficult challenge, to make it non-invasive. The first generation of wearables have just come out, and they are non-invasive, but they are limited to mainly electrophysiological measurements. They can measure your heart rate, your blood flow, maybe even the, the, the steps you take. That's great information. But the, one of the gold standards for clinical diagnosis is to measure circulating molecules in your blood. So we want to make a wearable, continuous device that measures as many of these same blood markers as possible. Kind of think about it like it's a Fitbit on steroids. We do this with a technology called microneedles. Now, just as it sounds, they're just very, very small needles. Here's an example of microneedles that we make in our laboratory. They're made out of metal. They're pyramidal in shape, hollow with an offset bore to draw in biological fluids. To give you an example of their size, here's a penny right here. When I turn it on its side, it is 1.5 millimeters tall. These microneedles are 0.75 millimeters. You would need to stack two of these microneedles on top of each other to be as tall as this penny right now. Compare that to a traditional hypodermic needle, which penetrates deep in the muscle and is very painful. Microneedles barely pierce the stratum corneum, the outermost layer of the skin. They're so small, they don't reach nerve endings. You don't feel a thing. Microneedles were originally developed for drug delivery purposes, and they've proven to be very effective and the painless delivery of vaccines and drugs. We want to go the opposite way. We want to use them to sample biological fluids, but they don't reach blood capillaries like hypodermic needles, so we don't sample blood. We sample interstitial fluid. This is the fluid between cells in your skin. So let's think. How would a device like this affect your lives? First of all, it just makes it more convenient. If you can show up to the doctor with your results, or even better, measure yourself at home and send the results to the doctor, it saves time and it saves money. But it's more than that. Continuous health monitoring is invaluable. Here's a profile from an implantable blood glucose me meter that measures you over the course of 24 hours, this solid line. You see it jumps up all day long, goes up and it goes down. Those red dots are the results from a finger prick test where you might test yourself four or five times a day. You can measure yourself and seem healthy with intermittent monitoring and miss all these highs and lows. If we can make a medical diagnostic device 
that is so simple, you measure yourself when you're healthy, it makes diagnosis more accurate, it makes it faster, and you can even diagnose yourself before you feel symptoms of getting sick. I started working in the field of microneedle sensors back in 2010 at Sandia with my colleague Philip Miller. And we used a technique called electrochemistry, where we try to use chemical reactions to convert the presence of molecules into electrical signals. So we have made microneedle sensors to detect glucose, so a diabetic can measure his blood glucose at home, lactate, an important metabolic marker, and even skin pH. Now taken together, all these markers are a good indicator of your health, but, but measured simultaneously, they are fatigue markers. So there's something an athlete might use to optimize his performance. The Department of Defense wants us to use these to, um, to measure the performance of soldiers on the battlefield. So we have started making devices to measure multiple markers simultaneously on these microneedles. Here's an example of a device we have made. It's a microneedle fluidic chip with microneedle arrays, sensors integrated, and we use this to detect a protein called troponin, which is a cardiac marker that is released when you have a heart attack. So it's something a person with a previous history at home can slap a patch on and see if they're having another event or just stressed out. We have also made a microneedle device to detect electrolytes, such as potassium. Um, when we published this article, it was featured on the cover of the journal that month. And very soon after, game one of the NBA Finals, LeBron James got a muscle cramp and had to leave the game. We actually got calls. The people said, hey, we read about your electrolyte sensor earlier and we thought it was cool, and now we think it might be really valuable. We were on the evening news. They said, could your device have helped LeBron James stay in the game? So we said, well, yeah, that's the point. If you can be measuring your electrolyte levels, you see a negative trend, tell them to drink Gatorade, or maybe even have other microneedles inject a countermeasure. And then we tried to make the point that it can be helped non-famous people too. But <laughs> I, I didn't complain because you can't buy that kind of publicity. <laughs> Currently, we are doing clinical studies on these at the University of New Mexico Medical School with Dr. Justin Baca, an emergency medicine specialist. One of the things we discovered is how to put the microneedles in and extract fluid out of the skin. That's that clear fluid you see in that glass capillary. Completely colorless, no red blood cells, pure dermal interstitial fluid. Now today, in health monitoring, when you sample biological fluids, it's primarily blood, urine, saliva, even sweat. Nobody measures skin fluid right now. But the skin is not just a protective barrier to the outside world. Your skin is an organ. It has its own unique immune cells called Langerhans cells. In fact, the skin is the largest organ in the human body. So we've been taking this fluid out and analyzing what is inside. And one of the most interesting things is we found that this fluid is full of exosomes. Those are these spheres you see here in these electron microscope pictures. Now, exosomes were discovered in the 80s, and they're still a little bit of a mystery. They form inside of cells, and they capture biological molecules like proteins, genetic material like RNA, and then the cell will spit it out. So they are originally thought to be like nothing more than garbage trucks, where the cell would be wanting to get rid of unwanted molecules. Then they started to notice that these exosomes would travel through the body, and another cell would take them in. The cells are talking to each other. This is how cells communicate. And the cargo inside of these exosomes have messages and instructions, both good and bad. An immune cell can release an exosome that tells another cell we're being attacked, activate your self-defense mechanisms. And on the flip side, a cancer cell will release an exosome that causes another cell to become cancerous. So we want to use these microneedles to extract the fluid, intercept these exosomes, look at the proteins, look at the RNAs inside, read the messages. Can we understand how does the body defend itself? How does cancer spread? Can we make an early cancer detector? Can we make drugs that target these exosomes instead of the cancer to stop it from spreading? So coming full circle, we are still trying to make continuously monitoring microneedle sensor. By this time next year, we hope to have a sensor that measures lactate on a person exercising. But now we also think we have a research platform to look at how the body, how cancer spreads. Can we make new drugs to fight cancer? 
Can we use interstitial fluid as a novel method to do clinical diagnosis? It's a fun project. I get to work with great people. And thank you for listening. <laughs>